also um, uh, personalize the UI design as well as you know UI adaptation for mobile pervasive and ubiquitous computing. So uh, without further ado, let's um, join uh, please join us to you know um, um, recognize uh, this uh, great accomplishment. So um, so Dan and uh, Christopher. So um, um, it's our you know great pleasure to um, this is uh, oh to present you the 2019 um, most impact paper award and uh, congratulations. Thank you. I'm going to take your hand. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> Sorry. So. Um, the organization of the session is like this. First, the, the authors will present the paper, and then we will have a, a panel which uh, will discuss and reflect on the impact of this uh, paper to the IUI community. And towards the end, we will open this to the audience to take questions, okay? So without further ado, let's um, the authors to have start their presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Krzysztof. Uh, you will hear today from me and, and Dan Weld, but we would also like to acknowledge Jake Wobrock, who, who joined our project a little bit later, uh, but had tremendous impact on, uh, uh, on the project overall. Um, uh, so uh, our plan for today is to, to briefly give you a chronological uh, reflection on where this project came from and what we actually did, because the paper was published 15 years ago, probably only a small subset of you saw the original paper, and the original paper was only a, a fraction of the entire project. The project lasted for six years. And afterwards, both Dan and I will reflect on one idea that we believe um, we, we tried to influence, with which we tried to have an impact on, uh, intellectual impact on the community. So just to give you a, some idea of what the project was about, we've built a system that used decision theoretic optimization to automatically generate user interfaces. As you can see, the, we're able to build a system that very quickly uh, solved a fairly complex optimization problem to automatically generate user interfaces adapted to different screen sizes, uh, but also to different uh, device types. Um, uh, what, what's important about SAPL is that it not only you know, it changes the layout, but it changes what kind of uh, interactors are used to communicate different pieces of information. It changes the overall structure of the user interface as well as its layout. So it was a fairly complex uh, set of, uh, it, it was a very complex combinatorial problem to solve. Uh, to tell you where, where this uh, project came from, we need to go back uh, you know, quite a few years into the past. Uh, into, into the world where phones were used primarily for calling people, you know, like, hello, Dan, um, where if you wanted to go to the airport not by public transportation, you, you know, had to wonder if the taxi will come and it would take 20 minutes or 40 minutes to come. So th these were very different times. Um, lots of uncertainty. Um, but there were three really big ideas that... Uh, uh, that influenced our, our thinking at the time. The first one was that uh, people started documenting that uh, our software kept getting more and more uh, complex. Joanna McGrenery published a paper in 2000 uh, documenting the, this phenomenon and showing that most people used only a tiny fraction of the, of the features available uh, uh, in their software, but everyone used slightly different tiny subset of the features. So really what happened was that each one of us wanted a, a device of roughly this level of complexity, but each one of us wanted a slightly different version of this device, and the manufacturer's response was something like this. Uh, so this is how it manifested itself uh, in, the, in the world of, uh, of software. And the, the, the problem was that uh, you know, each one of us could find features that we needed in the software, but because each one needed a slightly different subset, often the features that we used a lot required uh, a lot of effort to get to. One thing that particularly peeved uh, Dan, and I remember it from uh, my early meeting with him, was that he felt that printing required just way too much effort on his part. So Dan being uh, from Seattle and uh, a nature lover, always printed duplex to, to save paper. 
Uh, and at that time, it required actually an uh, unreasonable amount of effort. So first you click on properties, then you click on features. Hello. Uh, then, you, then you select the, the, the kind of binding you want. Uh, and on, only then you have, to, you, you have to click one OK, and then you, you have to click yet another OK. So this was uh, you know, a, a lot of work just to, just to save the tree, but Dan persevered. But uh, he, he described to me a future world in which uh, you know, may, maybe this wouldn't be so hard. A, a world uh, in which uh, instead uh, you know, the, the software could recognize that we all have slightly different ways of uh, using the software, and maybe it could adapt itself to, uh, to it. So notice here Dan envisioned a, a universe in which the content of the, uh, uh, of, of the print dialog would be adapted to, to reflect the features that, that he used frequently. And not only that, he thought um, maybe we, we could design a universe in which uh, not only the, the duplex would be duplicated here, but the, the system would recognize that he only ever uh, used one version of, of the duplex, the book binding. So maybe rather than presenting a, a, a set of uh, radio buttons, the, the system would present the, a checkbox instead. So this was the second influence. Uh, sorry, this was the first influence. The second influence was uh, ubiquitous computing. So this was 10 years after Mark Weiser's, Mark Weiser's uh, very influential paper introducing the notion of uh, ubiquitous computing, the world in which we've got tons and tons of interconnected devices, some the size of the room, some the size of something like this, some that we could put in our pockets, and we would want user interfaces running in all of these devices, potentially requiring that we adapt both the content and the presentation of, uh, of the user interfaces. And finally, we, we recognized that uh, accessible computing was uh, was another area where we really needed to, to think about adapting user interfaces to, to individuals. And to illustrate this, this is, this is a gentleman uh, uh, with, with whom we worked at some point uh, in, in our study. He, he has spastic cerebral palsy. What you see here is his chin. He's using his chin to control the, uh, a trackball to, to control the mouse position. And he also had a head-mounted wand to tap on the keyboard. Um, uh, and, <coughs> Another person that we worked with, this lady has uh, muscular dystrophy, so severe uh, muscle weakness. Uh, while the previous gentleman could make rapid movement, he had uh, problems with dexterity and accuracy. Uh, this person had, could make very accurate movements, but had difficulty making large movements. So the, the way they, um, they uh, interacted with user interfaces was that the, the first gentleman had really difficult time accessing small interactors like scrolling or pull-down menus. Whereas the, the second person had a very hard time making large navigation movements. So what, what became very obvious to us is that uh, there wasn't such thing as one universal uh, design or one accessibility design that every individual with, uh, with uh, uh, impairments potentially needed a, a different solution because they had different sets of limitations and also different things that they could do well. So with these three uh, motivations, we realized that we wanted a world in which uh, user interfaces could adapt both uh, content structure and presentation to the individual tasks uh, and needs and preferences of, of their users. So we were, at the time, both of us were core AI guys, and we were super excited about symbolically manipulating abstract representation of the user interfaces, and we had fantastic plans for how we could uh, you know, transform the, the, the representations of these user interfaces to represent all of these different things. But there was this one annoyance that was left. Once we transformed these abstract representations of the UIs, sometimes, somehow we had to turn them back into actual user interfaces. Uh, so uh, we, we, we looked at uh, various approaches to doing so. At, at that time, quite a few people took inspiration from compilers. So using those techniques to turn abstract representations of UIs to, to concrete user interfaces. Others uh, took inspiration from uh, rule-based expert systems where designers' knowledge was codified in rules and transformed, uh, used that to, to generate user interfaces. Uh, we instead um, uh, conceptualized design a little bit differently. So uh, when you ask designers how, how they design, they describe the process uh, in, in a couple of steps. First, they generate a large number of possible ideas to understand what the solution space is, 
And once they have a large number of, of candidate solutions, then they try to understand, okay, which one, which one of, of these is better? How do I evaluate them? And then choosing the best from among this uh, uh, large set. So to us, it looked very much like optimization, right? Uh, so a process in which you first have to enumerate candidate solutions, then have some way of deciding which one of them is better than the others, and finally, uh, you, you, you need a computational process that, where you can uh, you know, perform this, uh, the, this, pro this selection quickly. So let me briefly tell you how, how we did it. So first, to enumerate the, the design space, as I mentioned, we, we are very excited about abstractly representing user interfaces. So we represented them as trees where the leaf nodes corresponded to the different types of information that needed to be exchanged between the application and the user, and the interior nodes corresponded to semantic groupings of these elements. And what we wanted was a system that would transform this uh, abstract representation into a concrete user interface, turning the, the leaves into specific interactors and the interior nodes into layout decisions. Next, to uh, evaluate the, the, the candidate solutions, now this is where things started getting complicated because we needed some computational mechanism that, would, that given two user interfaces would tell us that one of them was better than the other. So we needed some function that would take a user interface or a fraction of the user interface and say this design decision is better than the other. So we thought about it in terms of cost. So worse, worse design solution should have higher cost than a better design solution. Now, where, where does, should such cost functions come from? In 2004, when we published this paper, uh, the cost, cost function came from my head. I essentially handcrafted it, 50 different uh, nu numerical parameters. Uh, I managed to find the, the right selection of, uh, of these numbers so that uh, SAPL would generate uh, pretty good uh, solutions. But this wasn't particularly satisfying, so in the following years, we, we, we came up with two more approaches. One. Uh, of course, uh, would learn the, the, the cost function by asking an expert, uh, you know, how should I design and, and, uh, and using machine learning to, to, uh, uh, to infer the, the weights of, uh, of the cost function. And the second was, and this was inspired by, by our accessibility work, to learn the actual performance of, of individuals that we worked with. Uh, so it's the cost function would predict how long a person would take to, to complete a basic set of tasks with a, with a particular user design. So let me go into just a little bit more detail with this. So when we design, uh, when we design the cost function that learned from experts, the interaction model uh, was based on the idea that rather than rating the quality of the user interfaces, we would present experts with pairs of designs and each time we would ask which of these designs is better. So people, so the experts only had to perform pairwise comparisons, which turned out to be a more robust technique for eliciting uh, uh, reliable feedback from, from experts. And this turned out to be uh, uh, an effective thing once we paired it with an appropriate uh, learning algorithm. In just 20 interactions, uh, we, we could get high quality designs. So the, the system was, was within just 20 or 30 interactions with an expert was able to learn a cost function that really reflected that expert's knowledge reasonably well. And by uh, providing different answers to the algorithm, we could teach the algorithm to design very different kinds of user interfaces. So on the left, you see an interface designed for a laptop. On the right, you see an interface designed for a touch, touch screen. And they, the, the reason why SAPL was generating these different interfaces was because the experts told it uh, a different set of design principles. The second approach that we took to creating cost functions was to learn the actual performance of individuals, particularly individuals with user impairments. So because uh, most of our work in context of SAPL was focused on people with motor impairments, we specifically focused on how quickly people per could perform a set of activities with a user interface because the speed of, of performance was, was the major limiting factor. So, uh, we, we created a set of diagnostic tasks. We, we created a way of learning appropriate function. Uh, it turned out that Fitzler was not, not sufficient for people with complex impairments, so we created our own uh, models that could predict people's actual performance. And uh, you know, for, the, for the people that we showed you before, given, that, given this user interface designed for able-bodied people, this was the 
uh, the version designed for, for a person with spastic cerebral palsy, so somebody who had uh, low dexterity. This is a design for somebody with, uh, with muscle weakness. You might notice that the previous design still had the tabs at the top, so you still had to make large movements, but all of the interactors were large. Here, everything is tightly laid out in a single pane, no need to switch panes. Uh, and very importantly, we didn't tell Supple these are the rules for designing for these people. Supple, Supple inferred it by having a model of a person's performance and model of what they, what they were supposed to accomplish and finding a, a design that was predicted to be the fastest for that person. Um, so the, the last challenge was that we needed to, uh, that once we had the candidate solutions, we needed to, to find the best one quickly. And this was challenging because uh, for, for some of the designs, there were, you know, 10 to the 17 uh, different possible uh, solutions. So how do we search through such a large design space? If we did it naively, uh, you know, I would have tenure as a graduate student. I could, you know, stay till I retired. Uh, so we're looking for, for something uh, a little bit more efficient. So we, using, using uh, state-of-the-art optimiz discrete optimization algorithms with, uh, with some uh, clever constraint propagation and some parallelization, we're able to make it really interactive. So you've already seen this video, but now you can appreciate it. You know, searching through a space of 10 to 17 different solutions, we're able to do it in, in a fraction of a second. This is, this is rendering in real time on a machine that is you know, more than 10 years old. And trivially, we were able to generate user interfaces for very different devices simply by swapping the libraries of available widgets and by swapping the cost functions. And Supple was able to generate user interfaces for fairly complex user interfaces, like mail clients uh, for you know, uh, in high interactivity uh, uh, interfaces. Um, and I'm pleased to say that I was able to solve Dan's uh, printing problem. Uh, so, you know, uh, one, we, we actually had several solutions for this, but one solution was to uh, allow end-user uh, user customization. So notice that over here, a person can simply just drag part of the user interface, drop it in another person, uh, in another place, uh, and, and get a user interface that uh, uh, reflects this modification. And this is possible because the, the presentation of the UI was linked bidirectionally with the abstract representation so when the modification was being made in the concrete user interface, the, the underlying tree was being uh, modified and we could very easily re-render this user interface. So this bidirectional connection between the representation, abstract representation and the UI allowed us uh, to do uh, pretty large modifications. And uh, let me illustrate this point one more time with, with another user interface. So this is Microsoft Ribbon. So this is perhaps one of the first examples of responsive UIs, you will notice that as, as the window gets narrower or, or wider, the, the presentation of the ribbon changes. Things get hidden into pop-up menus, some, some of the text uh, disappears. Uh, so, you know, with Supple we could, you know, very easily reproduce this effect. Uh, but very importantly, while original ribbon, and I think even today's ribbon makes it incredibly hard to modify the, the content of the ribbon because with today's technique for, for responsive design, the designer kind of needs to know the content of the UI and makes assum make assumptions about the, the final device when they are um, designing the, the logic for, for the responsive behavior. With Supple, we, we could we could even modify the content. So what's happening here is that we created a new group. We are copying some functionality into this group. So we are on the fly changing the, the content of the ribbon. And despite the fact that the designer never, never saw this new, uh, new, new design of the user interface, as we, as we resize the screen, uh, you know, the, the, the supple ribbon uh, adapts, uh, adapts correctly. Okay. Let's see if HDMI disappeared. Okay, we're, we're here. Uh, so another, another thing uh, with Supple is that it was very easy to, through constraints and modifying the objective function, it was very easy to incorporate many different uh, con concerns into the design. So this is a design for, for a typical able-bodied person. By changing the, uh, the cost function, we could very easily design for a person with impaired dexterity by using uh, larger interactors. 
we could also very easily design for a person with impaired vision by, by constraining the sizes of the, of the uh, visual cues. But also, very importantly, we could combine both of these adaptations to design something for a person with both low dexterity and low vision, which is something that today's uh, adaptive uh, techniques still are not able to do. Most adaptive techniques are single disability only. So, uh, and uh, you know, uh, just to remind you of this, uh, of this previous result, uh, we were able, we, we conducted a study with uh, over a dozen people with very different motor impairments and with SAPL we were able to build a, a unique model for each of, the, of, of these people, a unique model of their abilities. We were able to generate unique user interface for that person. And in our summative uh, evaluation, when we evaluated people's performance on the standard user interfaces, people with impairments were on average twice as slow uh, as able-bodied people performing, uh, you know, performing standard tasks on uh, standard user interfaces. However, with SAPL generated user interfaces, which were optimized for each individual separately, we were able to close more than half of this performance gap. And this brings me to the impact of our work. work. Um, uh, so Dan and I will present one idea each. And to me, one of the most personally uh, impactful ideas fr from, from SAPL was something that with some colleagues we called personalized dynamic accessibility and with others ability-based design. But uh, the key principle was that uh, while public discourse about accessibility, even today, is still mostly about the possibility of access. We are asking, you know, can this person access a particular digital resource, yes or no? We, we realize that it's not really about the possibility of access, it is about the quality of access. We want to make sure that the access is equitable. And let me explain it through several concepts and examples. So first, the World Health Organization uh, definition of uh, uh, disability. So World Health Organization says that disability is a, is a limitation one experiences when executing a task or, or an action. So if I have trouble you know, picking up a pen, I am experiencing a disability. However, handicap is when you know, my particular health condition or difference impacts my ability to be involved in life situations. So my, uh, my ability to participate socially. So notice that this effect that we accomplished over here is, is very important for eliminating handicap and not just disability. This person, I didn't tell you that before, but he actually has a degree in computer science and he runs his own business, uh, his own IT consultancy. However, despite the fact that he's got an incredibly marketable set of skills, he lives in a trailer park because he's three times slower than his able-bodied uh, counterparts at performing basic tasks with the computers. Therefore, he can accept fewer clients, therefore he has lower income. Uh, so if he had user interfaces that were better adapted to what he could do, he would be able to perform his activities much faster and therefore he would have a much more comfortable life. Uh, this person was an undergraduate student at the University of Washington uh, and she experienced the following dilemma. She could access all of the software that was required in her courses, but if she took full load of courses, she was much slower operating the software so she couldn't finish all of her assignments, so her grades suffered. If, he, if she took fewer courses per semester, then her financial aid would run out before she got her degree. So in either way, she was not able uh, to, to prepare herself professionally for, for her career, not because uh, she couldn't access the, the software required in her classes, but she couldn't require it as well as everybody else. Another example of, uh, you know, to, to illustrate the concept of equitable design, this is Memorial Church at Harvard. If you want to enter it and you're in wheelchair, here, here you see the sign directing you to the side, and then there is this ramp that takes you to the basement entrance, and then, you know, you, you have to navigate through the basement to the elevator and eventually you, 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 you get up through the back door. Imagine if you were getting, if you were being married here and if you were in wheelchair. Entering church, you know, for your own wedding on a, you know, through the basement or even for somebody else's wedding or in any other situation. So this solution is sufficient to, to reduce the disability, right? This person can enter the church. However, they are, they are not being socially included in this experience. And I was delighted to see that in very recent renovation of, of Memorial Church, we now have this ramp on the side. Rather than going to the basement, there's this really aesthetically pleasing ramp so that uh, a person with, with a mobility impairment can 
uh, can come up like everybody else, enter through the, through the main door, not be separated socially from, from others. So this is something we are striving for. So this is the, the key principle of the, that we've been working with. And the second, of course, given our, uh, our technical uh, you know, mindset, is that we believe that it is not the responsibility of a person with a, with a difficulty to adapt themselves to existing technologies, but the technology has to adapt itself to the individuals uh, who, who, do, who do not conform with the majority standards. Uh, so one other project in which we worked with this concept was, uh, was a project in which we tried to adapt uh, web content to individuals with, um, uh, with color vision deficiencies. And again, we're striving not just for possibility of access, but also for quality of access. So let me illustrate. So here is a website that uh, through color communicates a lot of uh, emotional content. You look at this red luscious lips, you, you get it, unless you've got a color division def def deficiency. But notice that some of the content of this website is color coded. You've got these alternating links in, re in red and green. So for a person with a color vision deficiency, this color encoded information is essentially gone. Existing recoloring tools that will try to find a different set of colors that a person can perceive uh, focus on uh, decoding the color encoded information, but entirely ignore the quality of experience. Like, this is not red luscious lips. This is like, I don't know, Arctic kiss of death. Uh, <laughs> so uh, our hope was to, was to develop uh, a, a system that would both, you know, preserve the color encoded information and preserve as much of the, uh, of the emotional uh, content of the, of the color scheme as possible for people with color vision deficiencies. So the recoloring problem, you, you, have to, you have to recolor each image separately because uh, you, you, you have to work very carefully with just the subset of colors that this uh, image uses. And you, so you take an image, you take a, a model of a per particular individual's uh, color perception, and you create a, a personalized mapping from colors in this image to the colors that the person can see. You won't be surprised that this problem is often thought of as an objective, uh, as an uh, optimization uh, problem. And uh, when we approached it, we added new elements to this objective function that preserved both naturalness and, uh, uh, and uh, similarity to, to the original emotional uh, intent of the designer. We did some studies to, to actually understand how people with color vision deficiencies perceive emotional content of colors, and it turned out that it was quite comparable to people with regular color vision. Uh, and we developed a system that, given an original design, like this is, what a, this is what a person with color vision deficiencies would see. The color information is gone. Standard recolors would not uh, respect the kind of emotional intent. And our, our system recovered both the color encoded information and the emotional content. So this idea of equitable design so for, for quite a few years, I focused primarily on, uh, on uh, accessibility, but I realized that this uh, concept is actually much broader than that. And uh, several individuals helped me, helped me get there. So one of them was Margaret Burnett, uh, and Simone, one of our panelists, contribute to, contributed to this work. Um, uh, Margaret has worked for, for a long time systematically gathering uh, evidence showing that in our standard one-size-fits-all design, we often make decisions that slightly privileged men over, over women. When we design debuggers, when we design color schemes, when we design uh, features, we often do it in such a way that men just are just a little happier, a little bit more likely to succeed that, that women, than women. There are systematic differences among individuals, and often uh, you know, who gets to make these decisions influences you know, who, who gets to succeed with our software. So Margaret pointed out to some set of differences. Another one was my colleague Katarina Reinecke, who was very interested in cultural anthropology and design. And she pointed out a number of culture-related differences in uh, perception, cognition, and behavior that also uh, impact how, how accessible and usable software is to people coming from different cultures. And finally, uh, Indrani Medhi from uh, Microsoft Research uh, India has done a lot of work documenting uh, the impact of access to formal education and how people are able to, uh, uh, to deal with abstractions and uh, both the content and the presentation of, of modern Western user interfaces. So I would like to focus on the one project that Katarina, read, Katarina led 
that, uh, that is quite illustrative of the concepts that I'm talking about. So uh, pay attention to the screen. You, you will see one uh, design for just half a second. Okay, and now you will see another design also for just half a second. Okay, given these, given these two designs, how many of you would be more likely to make a purchase from a site that looked like the first one? How many of you would be more likely to make a purchase from the site that looked like the second one? Okay, so which, decision, which choice you made doesn't matter, but the fact that you confidently made this choice after seeing both sites for only half a second is very important because you saw very little about the uh, you know, semantics and content of, the, of these sites, but you, you created a lasted, lasting impression that not only told you that to you one of these was more uh, aesthetically pleasing than the other, but you also, tried, you also took it further. You, 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 it turned into a perception of trustworthiness, your willingness to, to engage with a site, and also something that you don't realize, um, sites that are more aesthetically pleasing, UIs that are more the, uh, aesthetically pleasing, are actually more usable. We are less likely to make errors, and when we do make errors, we are more likely to recover from them if a site is a, uh, designed as aesthetically pleasing to us than not. So uh, Katarina wanted to understand whether aesthetic appeal was universal, or whether it was actually substantially differing from person to person, because if, it, if there were substantial differences, it would mean that, again, one size fits all aesthetic design might possibly discriminate. So, one, so we conducted, so first we built Lab in the Wild, so it's a platform for conducting behavioral research on, uh, with unpaid online volunteers. By now we've had more than four, four million participants. Uh, it's a really great way to do research. Join us if you want to. Um, and one set of results was that looking at different levels of colorfulness, people from Germany, if you gave them too many colors, they started getting upset. Uh, <laughs> people from Chile, we couldn't generate enough colors. Um, uh, the optimum level of colorfulness decreases the more exposure we have to formal education, even after controlling for, for age. And notice what that means. Like, look, for example, at the design of uh, the edX site. So this site was, the, the mission of this site is to provide education to people who, you know, in faraway places who do not have access to formal education. But the, the design choices have, have been made, have been optimized for, for Westerners who already have access to, to, who already have had a lot of exposure to formal education. Uh, when we look at these designs were preferred by women much more than by men, these designs were pre preferred by men much more than women, you will notice that these designs are both for, for resources for, for programmers. So again, you know, when, when we design tools for programmers, we, we tend to optimize a little bit for, more for male aesthetics than for female aesthetics, with the consequence being that we make women just a little bit less likely to engage and a little bit less, less likely to succeed with these tools. So essentially, thanks to Katarina, I realized that, we, that there is a broad range in which we uh, design in such a way that uh, without meaning to, we, we end up discriminating against, systematically discriminating against uh, some, of the, some of the people. So I want to leave you with uh, these two messages and hand it over to Dan, who will speak about the second uh, uh, set of uh, concepts uh, that, that we believe are impactful about this work. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you very much to the organizers for the award. It really means um, a huge amount to me, um, and the supple work is, uh, is work I'm incredibly pleased with. It's also been an opportunity to take a step back and think about um, impact and what makes for impactful work, um, um, which is kind of tricky. So I mean, some things are kind of obvious. Choose an important problem. Um, you know, having the, the luck or the insight to choose the right approach to solve that problem, in this case, decision theoretic 
um, optimization. The luck that we happen to be um, one of the first people to, to recognize this and try to push it out. Um, on the other hand, um, I, when I'm writing a paper, every paper I write, I sort of think is going to be like this. And, and here we were uh, a little bit lucky. Um, I have a very strong memory. Um, you know, as we wrote the supple paper going to Ben Schneiderman, one of the uh, grand old uh, men in, in HCI, and trying to get him excited about the idea, um, he didn't like the idea at all. Um, and so actually, I think we have an awful lot to thank, um, to thank him for this, because it was this challenge that really um, caused us to push on things uh, a, little bit, a little bit harder. So in particular, one thing about impact is having the, the conviction to persevere on the, on the project. And, and Supple, actually, um, if we had left it with the IUI paper, I don't think it would have had nearly as much impact. And um, instead, we actually had to do a lot of extra work before we really demonstrated uh, some of the promise. And of course, um, in that is a lot of great collaborators who helped us especially um, Jake Wobrock. Um, another thing, just sort of thinking about impactful papers, there's this wonderful and very, very thought-provoking paper that came out in Nature um, a month ago that talks about disruptive papers versus um, developing papers and analyzes the citation um, graph um, for these two different kinds. Strongly recommend you think about this paper. Um, it's pretty interesting, but I think the key thing is if every paper was like aiming for a disruptive idea, then it wouldn't be any good. It takes a lot of developing papers in order to make um, a, a, an idea take shape and, and show its promise. Um, in one way, I actually am, am sad that Supple hasn't had nearly as much impact as I wish it would have. And I think we, we need to figure out some way of getting Supple-like tools into um, into the user um, UI design kits so that people can very easily create these kinds of higher level semantic representations like um, Christoph showed in terms of the functional tree representation of the UI so we can actually do that. Um, on the other hand, actually um, AI and some of the techniques that Supple uh, put forward is having a lot of impact. If you look at most of the software out there, AI is getting in in one shape or, or another. Um, and in particular, the idea of this decision theoretic optimization is getting a fair amount of play. And one example um, in crowdsourcing, um, so there's uh, a lot of work, some of which um, my, my group did, um, that shows that if you optimize crowdsource workflows, you can actually um, get higher quality results with much, much less labor. In this case, um, a system by Jonathan Bragg uh, got used 87% less labor um, than a system that we had designed ourselves uh, the year before and we thought was pretty good at the time. Um, another way to think about um, to think about Supple is trying to put it in the context of the, of the time. And the whole idea of uh, adaptivity and user interfaces, I think, was, um, was pretty confusing um, back in, in 2004. Um, so on the, on the one hand, uh, we had uh, this beautiful paper by Eric Korvitz that lays out principles of mixed initiative user interface is still one of my favorite papers today. Um, at the same time, we also had Clippy had just come out, violating all of those principles and, uh, and gathering a huge amount of wrath. Um, there was also, uh, we just had this big debate about whether software agents were the right metaphor, or whether direct manipulation was the right thing, and I think um, direct manipulation came out looking a lot better in that, um, in that exchange. Um, and th there are obviously lots of papers uh, that preceded our work, and they led a very confusing, um, uh, uh, confusing message about whether adaptivity was a good thing or a bad thing or just a mixed bag. Um, so one of the things I think we've made a fair amount of progress in the past 20 years is trying to figure out what are the principles that should be used when trying to put adaptivity into interfaces. Um, one of them is some work um, uh, that Christoph and I did with um, Mary Chawinski and Desney, uh, Desney Tam in AVI 06. Um, and we looked at a couple different ways that we could, um, if we're tracking what kinds of behaviors a user is doing in the interface, how could we make it easier for them to do it? So Christoph gave one example um, with the, the print dialogue, which was uh, one of my frustrations. Um, but we looked at a number of different models. So one model is 
um, uh, altering the salience of the interface. So just trying to take what you think the user is about to do and make it, in this case, color coded or possibly larger. Um, Another thing that people were trying at the time, uh, which seemed quite problematic, is moving things around in the interface and hiding um, elements that were unlikely to be used from, from drop-down menus. So here's um, an example of some functionality moving um, uh, around in the interface. Um, and an approach that we were uh, very excited about, and you could see in some of Christoph's examples, is this idea of a split interface, where one part of the interface stays very static, allowing a stable navigation where you can get access to all functionality. And then there's one part of the interface which is very dynamic and offers shortcuts. Um, and uh, the AVI paper um, has, uh, has a nice study that shows that this split interface idea is surprisingly good. And interestingly, the visual pop-out, the altered salience, um, users really didn't, didn't like that. Um, another piece of work I'd like to point people to is a paper um, uh, coming out at CHI um, uh, very shortly. This is a project led by um, Salima Amershi and a large group um, at Microsoft when I was there on sabbatical last year. Um, and what we did is go through um, a wide range of papers that have been published over the past 20 years and try to pull them together into a set of guidelines and then analyze um, existing software systems across the board in many, many different areas to see how these principles were being applied. And in particular, we try to group these principles into um, whether or not uh, they're sort of uh, how to guide the initial interaction with users, um, what to do during interaction, what to do when the AI system makes a mistake or is uncertain of its prediction um, and what to do um, over the course of time. Um, so uh, the principles in many cases are going to seem like common sense to you, but I'd like to give a couple examples. So one thing is to make sure that the system, that the hu human knows if AI is involved and it's not going to get it right all the time, to give them expectations about what kind of a job it's going to do. Um, so here's an example of um, uh, Microsoft Office's companion experience, which docks alongside your work um, and gives you um, suggestions, one-click assistance for grammar, design, um, data insights, and so on. And um, the way this is described to the user, in this case, it's called ideas. Um, and the use of the, the word preview gives you a sense that maybe it's not going to always be right. So it helps set the user expectation. Um, during interaction, I think there's a lot of important uh, uh, properties, many of which were elucidated in Eric Korvitz's early paper. Um, one I'll talk a little bit on, though, is um, how to manage um, to match socially relevant norms. So here, again, we've got the editor, which is making suggestions. Um, and it's using a very polite language um, uh, to indicate um, uh, the way it wants to, wants to interact with the user. Um, obviously, AI systems um, get things wrong uh, from time to time, and uh, so allowing the user to dismiss the interface or correct it um, is very, very important. In this case, um, it's an example of um, how Microsoft uses cloud services to uh, automatically generate um, alt text for images, um, and um, by you know, popping it up here, it invites the user to make edits if the system doesn't get it quite right. Um, and then um, over time, there's quite a number of, of principles. Um, one that uh, I think is really important is providing global controls where the user can um, provide feedback about what kind of assistance they want for the, for the UI. So as um, a Microsoft's Office editor allows more than just spelling and grammar checks, it allows quite a bit, and it has a control panel that lets you um, uh, set exactly what, you would, uh, what the user would like um, the system to do. Um, one other example I'd like to, to highlight is the importance of notifying users um, about changes in the AI. Um, and this is actually uh, followed up on an um, interesting paper by my graduate student, Gagan Banzal, based on some work that he did at Microsoft during an internship last summer. Paper appears at AAAI last month. Um, and the observation is that oftentimes, um, AI and a human are working together in a team. And the key thing to do is to make sure that the team itself um, has uh, the highest performance. 
But oftentimes, AI researchers focus much more on the performance of the AI system. Um, and the key thing is with machine learning, um, oftentimes, uh, when you update a machine learning system, training on more examples, for example, for more data, for example, you can really improve the accuracy of the machine learning system, and that's what AI people like to focus on. But what oftentimes happens is you get very low compatibility. So the places where the AI system makes mistakes change dramatically on an update. And this can be very confusing to users because users, just as we develop mental models of um, other people that we collaborate with, users develop mental models of the AI system and where they make mistakes, um, as, this paper, as this paper shows. Um, and um, here we've got an AI system which has a certain amount of performance, and hopefully the human and the AI working together have a higher performance. When you update the AI system, giving it a, a higher performance, you're, you're hoping that the team is going to do better. But oftentimes, as Goggin shows, the team actually does much worse. Um, and so uh, a key thing to do, as the paper um, go, goes into some detail about, um, is uh, to regularize by, based on uh, previous performance um, to make sure that the system doesn't change its behavior too much, as well as notifying the user when those updates happen. Um, so in summary, um, here are some of the things we've learned in the past uh, 15 years, um, and I strongly encourage people to, to check out this paper. Um, uh, I really think it's quite nice. Um, and uh, with that, let me um, thank you again and uh, switch things over to the panel. Yeah. My name is Henry Lieberman. I'm a research scientist uh, at uh, the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, and I've, um, I uh, was twice program chair of IUI, and I write the uh, blog for Tease for the transactions on intelligent interactive systems. Hi. Uh, my name is Simone Stumpf. I'm uh, from City University of London. Um, I'm my background is mainly in HCI with, with a bit of AI thrown in. Um, I have been very active in explainable um, AI. Um, I'm doing lots of other stuff in terms of personal information systems as well. Um, uh, so um, I think I'm a bit of the j jack, you know, the jackknife that Christoph told. <laughs> Uh, See, so yeah, I have my own mic. <laughs> uh, my name is Jeff Nichols. Um, I was a PhD student at exactly the same time as this work was going on, also doing uh, work in automatic interface generation. Um, and uh, But now I am a research scientist at Google. Uh, I work primarily on a, a, a new operating system, building a UI framework for that. But we are also thinking a little bit about some of these ideas. Maybe they'll get out sometime soon. We'll see. Okay, um, thank you. Um, first, I would like to ask the panelists uh, to reflect a little bit about the pa paper's impact based on their own experience. Um, yeah, Simone, can you maybe you oh, can start I'm, a little? I'm going first. Um, so um, when I was asked to to join the panel and and you know reflect a little bit on on the paper. Um, I actually hadn't read it probably since 2004, 2005, just after it came out. Um, but uh, about a week before this, I, I read it again. And um, what struck me is that it was a really nice paper. It, it was sort of one of those model papers where you go, you know, I have a question. And then the next paragraph, the question is answered. 
Um, so it was really nice academic work that um, uh, a lot of people from, from different backgrounds um, can actually read and, and it's approachable and it's, it's really clearly written. So if you, if you think about you know, writing an IUI paper, this is one of the sort of models of how to do it. Um, so I thought that that was really, really great stuff. Um, and then I started thinking about, okay, well, what has actually happened since then? Because it's such a, a neat idea. Um, and I think, as, as the authors already have pointed out, we're still with responsive design, right? A, a designer would take um, a sort of interface design and, and just adjust it for different um, displays and, and display sizes and make some um, uh, you know, decisions based on that. So, um, so I think you know, um, we, we might want to sort of explore a little bit why you know, we're still at that stage rather than having um, you know, adaptive interfaces being generated right now um, for all of the sort of software. And then I think, um, lastly, um, one of the uh, things I was thinking about is, well, what, what is the future? Where can we apply it? Um, and I think, um, and this sort of ties my thoughts and, and this panel and, and this presentation back to the, the, the keynote this morning. Um, so I work in explainable AI. Um, you saw, hopefully, uh, a lot of you saw the presentation by, by Dave Gunning this morning about, you know, this is the stuff that has been happening. And then, you know, as I was rereading re the paper, I was starting to think, well, what if we treat explainable AI as an optimization problem, right? So rather than um, optimizing for different displays, why don't we optimize explanations for different users? So again, making them accessible to all. Um, so, you know, you might have different presentation mechanisms, you might have different kinds of contents. Um, and that really sort of excited me, the possibility of using the same approach in completely different domains. Um, so I think, you know, um, it shows that this paper really had a lot of impact. Um, perhaps not immediately in industry, but definitely on, on the knowledge that we're taking from it. I'll go next, I guess. Um, so I think, you know, I, I was also really interested in that question of, you know, what would it take for this work, you know, to really become that real gangbusters thing, you know, in industry takes over and everyone's, you know, um, you know able to benefit from automatically generated interfaces. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons we really want that to happen is because it unlocks all this flexibility in our user interfaces, not just with the accessibility stuff, um, which Christoph showed, which obviously would be incredibly impactful, but um, just in terms of personalization, like can my interfaces, you know, the, can the new interfaces that I see be designed to look like things that I've seen in the past so that I can just, you know, have a, you know, build on my experience in order to, you know, be able to use my interfaces more effectively. Um, you know, if I'm using multiple things together, can I just, integrate these all into one user interface instead of having to flip back and forth between different apps that I'm using, um, you know, and just generally have to do a lot of, of my own work coordinating my interfaces. It would be nice if the system could just do that for me. Um, and I think one of the reasons um, that this hasn't happened yet ha goes back to actually the description of the user interface. Um, what I, I called my work the specification language I think Christoph talked about it as kind of the formal description of the user interface. Um, you know, that, I, I think there are two real big problems when we look at interface generation. One, I think, you know, with the, the optimization work Christoph showed, given that you have the formal description, we can generate really great interfaces. Um, but we have to get these formal descriptions written and tied into the code that actually operates the user interface. Um, and that's a whole other, you know, really big challenge that I think um, hasn't been addressed quite as well yet. Um, and it would be really great, in fact, to see all of you wonderful, you know, IUI researchers out there maybe think a little bit about that. Maybe we can close that gap 
um, and really, you know, see this work have um, even greater impact than it's had so far. Yeah, so um, I think this was a really great paper. Um, it was certainly, you know, a flawless model of how to write an IUI paper. But I think what really makes a great impact paper is that it continues to inspire. That even looked at from a 2019 perspective, there's a lot in it that really should inspire the work of all of us for the future. And um, I think one thing that struck me as I listened to um, Christoph and Dan's presentation was uh, mobile interfaces. We still have a really lot of work to do with mobile interfaces. Um, th and the CAI community, they spent a long time making principles for good design of user interfaces, user interface affordances and stuff. And then when smartphones came in, all that got thrown out the window. The interfaces are terrible. They don't have affordances. They have disappearing stuff. They have uh, invisible features. You know, from the standpoint of traditional uh, interface design, a lot of these interfaces are really bad. But I think people were so caught up in the thing. Wow, I've got a computer in my pocket. You know, that they were able to forgive it. And the Kai people dropped the ball. They didn't want to rain on the party. Okay, but we've had smartphones for a while now, and I think we need to really think about um, uh, improving the interfaces that we have. So, you know, it might be that user interface adaptation is a little disruptive, but you know, I wake up in the morning and suddenly, you know, some application I'm using has an entirely new interface because they downloaded it from the cloud when I was asleep, you know, and they weren't paying attention to my usage or to um, anything. So I think, uh, and some of the lessen some of the um, inspiring features that we saw, like being able to put up a dialog box and say, I'd like that to be more convenient, so I'll just drag that into the default bot dialog box. And I think those kinds of things are just great inspirations for where we could go um, uh, with interfaces in the future. Um, uh, using machine, now where we have a lot of machine learning stuff, it's a lot better. So it could do a lot better in using the trace of your actual usage and the usage of other people to improve the interface. So just sitting here listening to it, I was expired, inspired in at least 10 different ways. And so that's why we chose uh, this paper as an impact paper. Um, thank you. And uh, so, um, in the uh, author's presentation, as well as the you know uh, initial um, panel's uh, feedback, and uh, we already addressed some of the issues in terms of uh, this is a very nice framework, and also the impact uh, they have. Paper has a large number of citations, and uh, but mostly are from the research community. So they already said a little bit about you know how to make it even more easily to be adopted in the real world. So um, any more comments um, on how to, you know, what are the uh, things we can do as a community um, to uh, make it more easily adopted in the real world? Any more comments on that? Uh, I mean, I think beyond the specification language stuff that I talked about, I mean, I think there's you know, a whole, related to that, I think there's a whole, you know, area of work in kind of in terms of re, uh, outreach to designers, like, um, you know, how, supposing that a designer is designing a, an interface that they know is gonna be generated, you know, th that the final version of it's gonna be generated and it's gonna look different in different contexts, you know, how does a designer understand that? Um, how do they, you know, yeah, I mean, is the design process even the same when you're working that way? I, you know, I don't know. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to do there to kind of, you know, engage the design community um, and not just uh, keep it among our, ourselves as computer scientists. <laughs> um, well, speaking as a, as a former UX designer before I went into academia, obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, using adaptive interfaces that are essentially trained by um, the, the user um, has the potential to do away with most of the UX designers, right? Where, where they actually <laughs> just become, you know, the, the, the sort of trainers to set the, the sort of 
you know, empty trace kind of default position. Um, so, you know, you have a bit of work to do to kind of position it because essentially then the job becomes very, very different, right? Um, so I think, you know, uh, as Jeff said, reaching out to, to some of these communities and actually saying these are the benefits of doing that, here's how you would integrate it into your, into your work, and that doesn't mean that, you know, your design knowledge uh, gets wasted because we still need you. I think that, that is also important to consider. Um, I think we need a class action lawsuit, to be honest. I mean, I, I think uh, that designers oftentimes go out of their way to make things non-adaptive. We see that in HTML, which was beautifully designed to be adaptive, and all sorts of um, UI designers instead put these fixed width windows in there that, that just won't let me scale up for, for my bad vision. So class action lawsuit, that's my vote. Uh, Okay, I, I may go against the, the grain here. Um, <clears throat> I, I grew up as an AI researcher, and now I align myself with human-computer interaction because at some point, Tessalau, a, a prominent member of our community, uh, made me realize that as, as members of the IUI community, our ultimate uh, goal and our ultimate criterion of success is whether or not we make a positive difference in somebody's life. Even if we are you know, mostly focused on the AI, we evaluate the value of our work on the impact in the real world. So I teach an, uh, an HCI course, and the first thing that I say in the first class is that there is no such thing as user error. There's no such thing as a designer doing, ma making wrong choices. If, if somebody is doing, making an error, it means that we, as designers of the tools, have, have failed to understand their practices, their needs, and their values. So I, I think it's on us to, to really understand how designers work. Uh, what helps them ideate and how we can integrate you know, these, these wonderful ideas into, into workflows that make, uh, make sense for designers. There was a wonderful paper about 10 years ago titled GAMI that uh, showed how we can uh, recover uh, a, a functional specification, an abstract sp functional specification of a user interface by observing how a designer is designing subsequent versions of a, of a concrete user interface. So as designers ideate on concrete ideas, we can automatically recover the, the abstract uh, representation. And so the, the reason why, why this work is not having an impact is because we have not given designers tools with which they can, uh, tools with, that would reduce the overhead of creating the functional specification. And also, you know, Dan was speaking about uh, the, the importance of creating AI in such a way that is respectful and give users a sense of control and predictability of what's going on. We have not given that to the designers with, uh, with SAPL. They really do not know what's going to happen, but, but we could give them much more understanding and much more control so that they would feel much more confident that the designs that SAPL will create will, will not embarrass them. Uh, while I'm uh, going to join Dan's uh, <laughs> class action lawsuit as a co-plaintiff, I think uh, I might also uh, join uh, Simone's future class action lawsuit against uh, AI researchers um, for uh, violation of aesthetic rules. I think that um, you know we have to have uh, uh, kind of the ambition of the initial work. I think was not to <clears throat> to uh, make a statement about aesthetics or to, uh, to try to automatically design, um, it, making designs that obey some aesthetic rules, but I think that's not the end of the story. So I think, um, uh, I think designers might see their role differently as you know, combining aesthetics and functionality, but I don't think um, uh, you, know, you can have functional and ugly interfaces, and I don't think that's what people want either. Um. So uh, I, too, was struck by a number of the user interfaces that uh, Christoph presented um, for uh, people with physical disabilities. I thought they were really pretty ugly. We probably all, all noticed that. But what I thought was really interesting um, uh, truth is that beauty's in the eye of the beholder. So one question that we included in the user study that Christoph didn't report on was um, how pretty do you think this interface is compared to the, the standard one? 
um, and uh, and the people with disabilities thought that their interface was that the supple generated interface was much more attractive. So um, it's a little bit more complicated than one might think. Okay. Um, uh, any final thought on you know what might be the uh, main future directions for this uh, line of work? Anybody want to comment on that? Uh, so I have two, I guess, um, real quick. Uh, I think one, <clears throat> obviously, there's a lot more conversational interfaces today than there were um, back in 2004. Um, so thinking about how this work applies to that conversational space, maybe in optimizing grammars in some way, um, could be interesting. Uh, I, I think another area is in thinking about how to apply, you know, data about user interfaces to this process. Um, you know, as Christoph was saying, you know, a lot of, especially early on, you know, you you came up with the parameters yourself. Um, but it's not just the parameters, right? Like also, you know, there are only certain types of layouts that you could do because it was like either it's vertical from it or horizontal. Um, you know, and thinking about, you know, can we can we collect a lot of data about user interfaces and try to learn something from that and then apply it to, you know, figuring out how to make an interface more aesthetic, for example, or something like that. It could be interesting to try. Um, so I think um, what, what excites me um, in, in this work is, um, and I think that was hinted at, is, is sort of making it making things accessible to all and that means really individualizing to to the users and i think that that is really a, a powerful direction of how we can do that not just for um impairments um but also for other individual differences for example gender or different styles of thinking different needs that that we have um, in terms of the user interface. And so I think that that is a really powerful thing to, to go forward with. Okay, um, um, that's conclude the panel, but you know, now we open to the um, audience. Any questions uh, for the... Congratulations again, Dan and Christoph. So actually, uh, as a same to Shimon, I haven't read this paper for a long time. And today, actually, I just watched uh, um, Christopher present the paper, and I say, oh, gee, that's really neat. Uh, how can the current interface actually doesn't do a lot of things he just showed, right? So then I look at your another website, which is a beautiful website you did for the, it's called the World Lab? Lab in the Wild. Oh, lab in the, uh, lab in the Wild, right? So I'm just wondering, whether you can combine the two kind of like ideas together because you, and I also wholly, uh, uh, wholeheartedly agree with you, it is that you want your work to really impact people's life in the real world. So I recently had gone through this horrible experience it is because I didn't know anything about HTML, but we have to make a, a website for our company and my designer just quit. So I said, I have to do it. They have to learn the bootstrap, right? Bootstrap, nice thing about is responsive interfaces. So you have the different devices, so these different uh, uh, resolution, uh, we have different screen resolutions. I'm wondering how do you see the work you did uh, in SAPO can be actually applied uh, to web design? So maybe coupled with what uh, Jeff said, the last uh, suggestion of the future work. Uh, can we re use your work in SAPO? But the constraints might be changed, the cost function might be changed, right? But actually to design adaptive websites. For example, in my case, the people come in, I knew there are probably about five, six categories of people come in. They're looking for completely different things. I have no, I don't have time. I don't have that experience even, designer experience uh, to design adaptive websites for my potential visitors. And also, they have to look beautiful as well. <laughs> So I, I think your key question was how how do we use subtle like ideas to, to to make them actually work on the web? So yeah, don't, don't need to worry about Microsoft. Don't need to worry about. I don't know how many people are developing opening this room right now. I know how hard it is that you can use them. I'm just wondering, can you use it for really millions of people? Can you write millions of people how to design websites? 
So I, I think we could, uh, we could actually implement some of Sapple-like ideas uh, in, into a modern toolkit. I think it's just a SMOP, a small model of programming. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I don't think full Sapple-like solution would be quite feasible or quite appropriate for, for today's web, but I, I think there are some things that we ought to be trying. So for example, you know, we, we have some accessibility features built into the websites. You, you can often go to the top right corner and click on a large A, and you know, the, the website gets redesigned to have larger uh, visual cues. But we, we do not have the same thing for people with, with dexterity impairments, for example. So uh, you know, one of the huge uh, impairments to people with dexter dexterity difficulties is that when we have pull down menus, you, there are sev you, you have to perform several accurate clicks before, before you succeed. And if your probability of an error is 20% at each click, then essentially it becomes more and more impossible for, for you to, to complete the selection uh, accurately when you have cascading uh, menus. So, you know, we, 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 we want to create uh, adaptivity, either user-driven or, or automatic, that would not only change the, the layout or what's visible, but also, you know, would reason about what interactors we are using or, you know, perhaps even about, uh, about the content. Uh, I, I think some of it is, is within reach and we could do with uh, you know, moderate uh, uh, engineering effort. And I think we could do it in such a way that people would still have a, a sense of control. Um, if I only had the right graduate student. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? I have a fish list, and inspired by Christopher's work, and said, I, I teach and I use whiteboard a lot to write what I want to uh, tell to my students, and very often my handwriting could not be good enough to be read by students. In other words, my handwriting sucks. <laughs> I can't talk good, and I, my, my students need to be more improved by my handwriting. And I might wish this right here, you know, your technique could help people like me to have the good handwriting when they talk and write it in the, in the, in the right, uh, whiteboard or, or smart board. <laughs> well, I think that does, a, <clears throat> what that makes me think of at least is, you know, one of the possible solutions to the specification language problem we were talking about is, you know, to have people like sketch out a UI and then figure out what the specification from that is, and then that would get us to the optimization approach then we can apply from Christoph. Uh, I think that would be awesome. I think that's another great research project for someone to do. Hi, uh, Fabio Paterno from Siena. Uh, I mean, uh, nowadays, I mean, there are many adaptive user interfaces. I mean, uh, there's a responsive design, there are, you know, user interface, they change the content depending on what people like and so on. I mean, and they don't use uh, the SAPL approach. So the question uh, is, I mean, don't you think that maybe this idea to have a single cost function that is able <laughs> to predict uh, the best solution everywhere? is a little bit too ambitious to be deployed in real cases because it seems like, you know, where, where reality is moving is more towards solution where there are, uh, you know, many rules, uh, there can be conflict, but I mean, there is not really this concept of a cost function that automatically, oh, this is the best, that go that way. Um, I, I think, I think you're right that um, it would be hard to come up with a, you know, one generic cost function to rule them all. Um, but I, th I think the real problem right now, though, is that you're right that there are a lot of adaptive interfaces, but they're all created as one-offs. And as a result, not only are they, uh, I mean, it's nice that they're, that they're there and that they've been created, but they're also a little inconsistent with each other. Um, sometimes they may be, Maybe that's appropriate for the domain. I think in other cases it's not. I sit down in front of one tool and I'm like, oh, it adapted that way. I sit down in front of something else and it's like, what did it just do? I don't understand. Um, and so I, I do think it would be great if we could have a framework in which we could implement those cost functions. Maybe we do different things in different domains, but um, you know, I, I don't think the current situation today is great. One thing that um, 
dimension that I think is not appreciated enough uh, in interface design is the difference between high functionality and low functionality interfaces. So when the interface, you know, like, uh, like the difference between Apple's preview on the Mac, which is an image editor, but it has, does, can't really do very much, and then Photoshop, okay. And I think uh, a lot of the interface problems we get from trying to use the methodology of low functionality interfaces to then design high functionality interfaces. And, uh, and I think that's where things screw up. So, you know, if you have just a few operations, yes, you can lay them out on static menus and they don't have to change and that's fantastic. But with high functionality interfaces like Microsoft Word or Photoshop or, um, uh, you know, these things get very complex very quickly and the static interface design solutions are just not, don't, do not work and people still try to shoehorn them in. So I think one of the biggest challenges that I think this could be uh, interesting and useful for is to try to make better interface design for high functionality interfaces, which have to be more adaptive. Yeah, I, I'd just like to tie this back to um, Simone's comment earlier and explainable AI. I think one of the problems with um, high functionality user interfaces is when they do something mysterious that the user doesn't understand and it's very, very hard for them to figure out exactly why that just happened and to, to make the transition where they have the, the greater understanding. So figuring out a way of doing that I think is an exciting challenge for the future. Uh, maybe in addition to uh, explainable AI, we need explainable UI. <laughs> okay, yeah, since uh, it's already lunchtime, I take one more question, okay. Um. Hi, Kashyap from Alta University. Thanks for the great talk, I love this paper. Uh, I also work on adaptive interfaces and I'll be presenting something about that makes the web adaptable later. Uh, my question's more about the cost of adaptation for users. I think one of the main things that makes adaptive interfaces annoying is that every adaptation has certain cost to it, and we still haven't fully understood how to model this cost to the users. So do you have some insights on how you tackle these challenges? Um. <clears throat> Uh, I don't know why, why he's not speaking. He did the best work on, the, uh, uh, on this problem. Um, so the, the question is, if, if we're used to, to, to something and then an adaptation occurs, we incur a cost because we have to deal with something new. So the question is, how, how, do, we, how do we do adaptation in such a way that we both leverage the, kind of the, optimally leverage the new situation and the, the existing knowledge that we've had? So I think your work wa was the, the most uh, extensive and profound in this area. We, we tried to copy you a little bit by extending our cost function to also have, a, uh, have an element that, that tied the new design to the previous design. So actually, we, we did have a version of SAPL that given what you knew and given a new situation would try to generate user interface that would uh, be as similar to the previous design as possible while also incorporating the, the new uh, functionality and constraints. Yeah, I mean, I think, so I, I did a fair amount of work on producing um, what we called personally consistent user interfaces, which I think is what you're talking about, right? Um, that paper, I think, was at CHI 2006 or something. Um, and I think there were several big challenges there. Uh, one was around, um, a big part of it was around like, well, if there are really large changes between the two interfaces, how do you reconcile those? If there's different functionality across the two interfaces, how do you reconcile that? We came up with some heuristics that seemed to work, at least in the domain that we were in. Um, but I think, I, I don't think there's a silver bullet answer. Um, uh, and I haven't seen any work on that since, I don't think. So. Go read that paper from 2006 and see, see if you agree with what we did, I guess. I, I fear that we are about to end, so I just wanted to say that getting an award is the best way to ensure that you don't get to speak to, us, to students at the conference. So I just want to say that both Dan and I really enjoy speaking to students, and we are also not particularly outgoing. So if you think you've got something, a, a related interest, please talk to us. Thank you to the panels and also congratulate to the authors. So this concludes the um
session.